In a quiet corner of Westwood, California, hemmed off from sounds of traffic, the scene is repeated countless times, warmed by some afterglow, some myth that speaks. Nameless visitors still bring flowers to the crypt of a woman they knew only on film, Marilyn Monroe, who died 25 years ago. Today, she remains an enduring figure. Signs and billboards still exploit her continuing appeal. Photographs and memorabilia are displayed in stores and galleries and bought by adoring collectors. Fan clubs still celebrate her life. Young women try to imitate her makeup. Even the vastly popular Madonna often bears a striking resemblance to Marilyn's appearance and style. I've heard of affairs that are strictly platonic, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. And I think affairs that you must give Today, Marilyn Monroe's popularity extends widely to those not even born until after her death. Yet for many, she is a haunting presence, a heroine in distress, the cry in the night that no one answered. In the next hour, we shall retrace her career, hear from friends who knew her, hear Marilyn speak for herself. In film never before shown, we shall see her in unguarded moments and in the early troubled years before the world fell in love with Marilyn Monroe. It's, it's amazing that all these years later, uh, Marilyn Monroe is still more famous than most movie stars much more famous than more chiefs of state. It really, it really is a phenomenon. And I think it has to do partly with just the fact of her premature death, because we do continually kind of push at that boundary with our imagination, what would have happened. It just didn't all happen real easy. She just didn't walk on a set and they said, roll them, and uh, she did it. It took a lot of time, a lot of rehearsing, and to, to create that whole image and to create that kind of wonderful sort of thing that she did. She was a funny girl, you know. Naturally, I mean, on the natural, a funny girl, but but uh, she always thought they're looking at somebody else. Susan Strasberg, daughter of actress studio founder Lee Strasberg, oh, yeah. and a close friend of Marilyn's. It's fascinating to me that Marilyn, in fact, for millions and millions of people who didn't know her, is more alive today than she was when she was alive. She's on more covers, she sells more books, more cups, more sun shields, you know, and she rises. It's interesting because she continues to rise above the level that everyone keeps trying to pull her down to why, how, who, all the kind of questions and the things, and there's some, the quality that she had, just, it's like, you know, a, you know, a lotus that grows, in, that grows in the mud. Goodbye, Norma Jean. We called her Marilyn, as if we knew her well. She was the siren of happy hours, a figure in a dream, a phantom on celluloid. Yet sometimes, the dream girl turned her face to the wall, 
a victim trapped in the push and clamor of the curious crowd, stripping away the last curtain on private anguish. For Marilyn Monroe, life was a labyrinth of tangled pathways, a jigsaw puzzle of wildly assorted pieces, some still missing. For a time, she was an enchanting presence on the world's screen, but beneath the manner and the makeup, she was embarked on a more private journey. Though she played many parts off stage and on, her life was a long search for the most elusive role of all, herself. She was the little girl from nowhere, trying to find where she belonged. Born Norma Jean Baker, illegitimate child of a troubled mother, denied by her father, she would one day create a new public identity on the strips of make-believe her mother now handled as a film cutter. Within days of her birth, she entered a world of strangers, with her mother's commitment to a mental hospital, a blurred succession of adult figures briefly became her surrogate parents. I didn't like the world around me too much because it was kind of grim. But I loved playing. And I loved playing with the children in the neighborhood, you know, running out and playing. We could, we could imagine anything and pretend anything. Not until 11, after two years in an orphanage, did she find a more permanent home with a new guardian, one of her mother's former co-workers. Freer, more secure, she did well at school, made new friends, among them the members of the Howell family, who now remember beach romps with the teenage Norma Jean with great affection. She was a lovely, lovely girl, and we loved her. And she called us Aunt Doris and Uncle Chad. It was wonderful to have her at the beach with us. She was just a happy teenager, playing in the water and just doing cartwheels and really uh, enjoying herself. We bought her uh, her first bathing suits. She was so thrilled. We had been asked to uh, adopt her, and we really, really considered it because we loved her. She fitted in with our family beautifully, but finally we decided not to because we already had three daughters, and we just really felt we had enough to take care of. Now, moving east, her guardian urged 16-year-old Norma Jean to find security in marriage to a bright young athlete, Jim Darty. Seventy-five people came to the wedding reception. My husband walked down the aisle with her. The aisle was made by my twin daughters. World War II brought an early separation. Darty joined the Merchant Marine. Norma Jean found work making parachutes. There, an army photographer, seeking pictures to cheer up men at the front, took a picture that also cheered Norma Jean. Within months, she turned professional. Quickly, she became the favorite model of several of the top Hollywood photographers. Changed from brunette to blonde, became a star of newsstand magazine covers and calendars. I did have to pay uh, the rent where I lived at the Hollywood Studio Club. I was four weeks behind. You know, when he first said, you know, pose nude and other photographers, I'd say, hey, me? Are you kidding? Never. When I was a kid, I used to dream of red velvet. I used to thought that was, I don't know, but I never thought I'd end up nude <laughs> on red velvet. <laughs> In an early TV commercial, she simply played a lady who ran out of gas. This is the first car I ever owned. I call her Cynthia. She's going to have the best care a car ever had. Put Royal Triton in Cynthia's little tummy. Right, lady. Divorced at 20, name changed to Marilyn Monroe, her career was paced by a widening circle of male escorts. 
agent and lover Johnny Hyde gained her a critical role in John Huston's Asphalt Jungle. Some sweet kid. It's late. Why don't you go to bed? Sweet kid. You hear about Marilyn in the casting couch, but I think she was uh, sleeping with men in order to get work, not instead of working. And much of what she experienced in Hollywood, we would now term sexual harassment. Then it was just called life. There was not a word for it. Signed by 20th Century Fox after uncertain beginnings, Marilyn appeared in a quick succession of films. Robert Wagner remembers. When we were at Fox and we were, we were rehearsing, I remember we went out to dinner, we were talking about acting, you know, and about where, where we were going to go and what was going to happen maybe in the future and would we, you know, would we ever get there, would we ever make it, that kind of thing. And my God, you know, it's incredible when you think that all of a sudden, like that, boom, off she went. Stardom can have varied definitions. To some, Marilyn was a list of measurements, 36, 23, 36, a lady with a bust and a bottom that were big news. But beneath the measurements lay magical talents not until Gentlemen Prefer Blondes in 1952 did a wider public glimpse the incandescent figure it cannot forget. On your humble flat Or help you at the automat Men grow cold as girls grow old And we all lose our charms in the end But square cut or pear shape These rocks don't lose their Shape. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. If I am a star, the people made me a star. There was no studio and no person. Uh, the people made me a star. But stiff back or stiff knees, you stand straight and After nearly 20 films in six years, Marilyn became the title of a song here played in her honor with Mickey Rooney on the drums. But if luck is with me, she'll be my bride forevermore. I'll be marrying, carrying Marilyn through. But success is no guarantee against a bad movie. In it, her co-victim was old friend Robert Mitchum. That's where we're back at the studio. We're doing the interior stuff, and uh, there's a guy with a fire hose, you know, and it's a 75-pound uh, stream. And he's hitting me on the gusset with this thing, and, and he's trying to knock us off the raft. But anyway, it's time, take after take after take. This guy's in the water all the time. And Marilyn said, they, they got to, wait a minute, she said, he's turning blue, they got to get him out. You know, to turn a blue, she said, like, look at him, the water's gotten to him, the cold, he's freezing. I said, I hope he, can ne I hope he never sings again. And she, and she insisted they get rid of him and bring another guy. You know. With Jack Benny, Marilyn learned that sometimes failure can be a joke. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Marilyn, um, 
This is your first, first appearance in television, isn't it? Yes, it is, Jack. Well, I'm quite flattered that you made your first appearance on my show. I really am. You know, I, um, I made a picture once. Um, <laughs> the uh, horn blows at midnight. And I believe if that had been made in CinemaScope, it would have been a huge success. Yeah. Well, you know, CinemaScope is very complicated. Mm -hmm. In order to put the big screen in all the theaters, they have to take out a lot of seats. Mm -hmm. Well, in my picture, they could have taken out all of the seats. <laughs> Well, I don't know why you're always panning the horn blows at midnight. I saw it. You did? Yes. And you don't know why I'm panning it? Did you like it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks ever so. <laughs> so long. Goodbye, Marilyn. In good times or bad, some recurring quest drew her back to the games and trials of children. Now a famous personage, accompanied by the inevitable cameraman, she seemed to find there some secret kinship to her own haunted childhood. The loneliness and fears and confusions of childhood Marilyn knew well. Then she began to learn that success too could become a phantom, discover the insecurities of a career in which Studio executives played parent and master. Already she'd begun to assert herself. Demand recognition, the studio appeared slow to give. Meanwhile, she played again the wide-eyed comic heroine the public adored. Is he kidding? Not at all. It's an old custom of the East to make the stranger feel welcome. You can tell him for me, I think he's simply a doll. And I couldn't be crazy about these old Eastern customs. In sleep, she had dreamed of a fortune in jewels. Instead, she married Joe DiMaggio, long one of the reigning heroes of baseball. On their honeymoon, the pair headed for Japan, where baseball had become a growing craze. But it was Marilyn who stole the show. Mobbed by admirers, the couple often had to escape by emergency exits. Then, in a highly charged encounter, she visited South Korea. For 17,000 American troops, it was a brief recess from war. For Marilyn, the crowd's tumultuous adoration was a memorable experience. I'd say the highlight of my life was singing for the soldiers there. I stood out on an open stage and it was cold and snowing, but I swear they didn't feel a thing except good. But for DiMaggio, it was disheartening. Long retired, eager for a private life, his marriage had quickly become a public enterprise. And Marilyn wanted very much to be taken seriously, to have dignity, to be seen as a serious actress not to be made fun of, not to be seen as a dumb blonde. And, and in a way, she is just an exaggerated version of what has happened to many, many millions of women. Perhaps that's part of our fascination with her. Many women had, had sort of spurned her and been put off by her because she was a bit of an embarrassment. And also there was a kind of competitiveness, you know, I mean, she was only supposed to be of interest to men, not, not to women. I think we felt bad about that, that we had um, allowed her to disappear behind this stereotype. Amid growing tensions between herself and DiMaggio, Marilyn went to New York to film The Seven Year Itch. Well, we're here to make uh, The Seven Year Itch. Location shots on The Seven yes, Year Itch? Uh -huh. That's your latest picture, right? Yes. Yes, I'm looking forward to it very much. Joe didn't come along with you, huh? No. Did he see you off in Hollywood last night? Oh, yes. Well, you brought your hairdresser and your drama coach and uh, four men from 20th Century Fox. All this and no Joe, huh? Isn't that a shame? <laughs> okay. 
I understand there's some fabulous location shots going to be made next Saturday night uh, on Lexington Avenue when you uh, uh, do the Coney Island treatment, you know, walking over the uh, subway grating and uh, a gust of wind catches you and so forth. I imagine you'll stop traffic again on Saturday night. Well, I'm looking forward to working in it very much. But her husband did arrive in New York. There, the skirt-blowing scene at 2 in the morning would require numerous retakes before a large street audience that included DiMaggio. Oh, do you feel the breeze from the subway? Isn't it delicious? It sort of cools the ankles, doesn't it? The blast may have cooled Marilyn, but it heated Joe DiMaggio who had seen his wife exposed to 4,000 avid watchers. Six weeks later, after less than a year of marriage, Marilyn was granted a divorce in Santa Monica. The marriage had failed after a record of explosive arguments and opposing needs. Now a more independent Marilyn was beginning to emerge. She turned down two studio assignments in succession and was again suspended. In response, Marilyn formed her own company with one-time photographer Milton Green, then moved back to New York. There she would find new dimensions in her talent, a new sureness in who she was. Once she played scenes on a soundstage. Today, Marilyn Monroe has joined a mixed cast of teddy bears and stuffed mice in toy shop windows, become a star in bookstore displays. Dozens of volumes have celebrated her career, told of her troubled life, her affairs, the mysterious circumstances surrounding her death. Today, the young have made her an enduring That's heroine. Oh, I know. That's, That's really... Good. I like this one. I love this, this one right that, here. That's good. That's a classic. <laughs> It's amazing because I was uh, driving down Hollywood Boulevard and I saw this uh, billboard of her. And it's amazing that after somebody is no longer alive, we're like really worshiping them. And uh, she sure, sure didn't feel that when she was around, except by maybe her fans then. But I mean, inside, she didn't feel that. Well, there was some mystery about her. And a lot was said. Uh, you know, it's hard to distinguish rumor from fact, fact from fiction. And uh, I don't know, people are just surprised that the the aura that surrounded her. That type of femininity is, is almost long gone now because it's not fashionable, or at least we've been told by the feminists that we're not supposed to be that way anymore. She just had that charm that maybe you wouldn't want to see her all the way, but, but uh, I don't know, there's something about her. It's magic. She pretty much can inspire people to live their dream and I think that's kind of why she's so famous and that she gives off, in part of her character, a willingness to help other people and a real innocence. At almost the same age as many of her present admirers, Marilyn was already a film star recognized around the world. Yet, as she fled Hollywood for New York, she sought for a time an anonymity in which she too could become a student at the famed actor's studio explore new ways of thinking and seeing, find new streets on some inner map. Yet even here, the world still came to call. Tonight we'll be going first to Western Connecticut, where photographer Milton Green, his wife, and their friend and house guest Marilyn Monroe will be waiting for us. Well, would it be fair to say that uh, you got rather tired of playing the same kind of roles all the time and, and wanted to try something different? Well, I, it's, it's not that I object to doing musicals or comedies. In fact, I rather enjoy it. But I would like to do also dramatic parts, too. Well, are, are you always recognized wherever you go in, in the nearby towns and in New York? No, not really. Um, I can put on a no polo coat and no makeup and get along pretty well. So we were walking down the street together, nobody paying any attention to her. And she looked at me and she said, uh, hey, you want to see me be her? I had no idea who, what she meant by be her. 
So I said, sure. And she made some inner adjustment. Almost like, you know, if you see a, a lamp that's got a bulb in it, but the lamp is turned off, all she did was turn the lamp on. And suddenly she started to glow. And people st start, started stopping, going, oh my god, is that? Oh, it can't be. Oh, it must be. And it was fascinating to me that she was aware enough of what she did to be able to do it. Her social life followed a similar pattern. Sometimes it was high key with a roster of famous men. Marlon Brando. Carl Sandburg. Truman Capote. Arthur Miller, with whom a romance began. But Gloria Steinem remembers the quiet acting student. When I saw Marilyn at the actor's studio, um, I was just shocked at how different she was from the movie star image. She didn't seem to have any makeup on. She looked kind of luminous, but just enormously shy and sitting way at the back of the room, just observing other actors do an exercise. And it felt as if the other New York actors were trying to uh, avoid looking at her as if to say, you're just an observer here. Granted her demands by the studio, Marilyn returned to Hollywood. Marilyn, how do you feel about coming back to Hollywood? Is this a happy time for you? Yes, it is. It's a very happy time. I'm happy to be back. As, as I said, it's my right? hometown. Yeah. Is it true that you uh, submitted a list of directors <clears throat> you would work with? Um, we only know the rumors we hear, you know. I would rather say uh, that I have director approval, and that is true. This you think is important? Yes, it is. Very important to me. You're wearing a high-neck dress now. The last time I saw you wear it, is this a blue Marilyn, a new style? No, I'm the same person, but it's a different suit. <laughs> The tempo of her life quickened as she played one of her finest roles. It's awful hard for a fella after he's been turned down once to get up enough guts to try again. You don't need guts, Paul. I don't. That's the last thing in this world you need. Anyhow, I just don't have any now. So I just have to tell you what I feel in my heart. Yes? I still wish you was going back to the ranch with me more than anything I knew. You do? Yeah, I do. anywhere in the world with you now. Anywhere at all. You would? Anywhere at all. Again returning to New York, she surprised the press. When are you getting married, Miss Monroe? It'll be sometime between now and the 13th of July. Where, do you know? No, I'm not sure where. When are you going to be married? I don't know right now. I haven't had a minute to think, but it'll be shortly. I think it's time enough for everybody to know when it happens and to leave us with a little bit of peace until it happens. When are you planning to have some children? Well, I'm not married yet, dear. <laughs> she called all of her lovers or husbands daddy or pa or some version. I mean, you know, she, she was seeking the father she, she never had. A month later, though charged with contempt of Congress during the McCarthy period, Miller was permitted to accompany Marilyn to London for the filming of The Prince and the Showgirl with Laurence Olivier. Despite temperamental tensions, the picture was completed, and the little girl from nowhere got to meet the queen. But in Washington, Miller still faced trial on contempt charges for refusing to name leftist friends. 
How long have you been here, Miss Monroe? Since the beginning of the trial. Just staying in the house here? That's right. Has the trial upset your personal life to any degree, Miss Monroe? Um, I would like to say that I'm fully confident that in the end my husband will win this case. And it didn't upset your professional career at all? It didn't stop anything you were working on at the time? Uh, no, I haven't been working recently. And what are your plans when you return to New York? Well, we hope to go back to our normal life. For a victorious Miller, back to normal meant carrying a heavy burden of legal bills. For Marilyn, it would mean a miscarriage. Later, to help pay legal costs, Marilyn took a role she didn't want in Some Like It Hot. It was her most successful film. Look at that! Look how she moves! That's just like Jello on springs. Sugar? <laughs> Here. I'll try the instruments. Thank you, Daphne. Oh, thank you, Daphne. Isn't she a sweetheart? While filming at the Coronado Hotel in San Diego, Marilyn was again the center both of the crew and of the crowd of admiring spectators, one of whom filmed this scene. Clearly pregnant again and feeling a moment of distress, Marilyn was helped to a dressing room by her husband, for whom marriage sometimes seemed to have replaced his writing career. By July 1960, Miller had written The Misfits for his wife. It would be directed by John Huston and co-star Montgomery Clift and Clark Gable as the male leads a prize cast. But the Miller marriage was broken, and on Marilyn, drugs and alcohol were taking a visible toll. Shooting continued amid delays and fractious arguments. Gable finally complained that Marilyn was going to give him a heart attack. But in one scene, Marilyn's outcry seemed an anguished protest against the injuries of her own life. Just stand aside, honey. Okay, you won. All right, you won. Let's go, that rope. Get out of here. Hey, darling. Pull him. Don't keep down, Guido. Get off, Guido. Roger. Stop. Get him. Get him. Roger. Shut up. Pull that horse down. Get on. Point two. Now. As Gable had feared, he did die of a heart attack two weeks after The Misfits was completed. Months later, Mrs. Gable would bear his child. Among the Hollywood notables who attended the christening, Marilyn also appeared. Alone, beautifully dressed, she moved among the guests and offered her congratulations. Yet beneath her flawless manners, only she knew the chill inner landscape of her own experience. The long record of miscarriages and abortions, the attempts at suicide. In early January 1961, Marilyn would get a Mexican divorce from Miller. She checked herself into the hospital, and somehow or other, she got put into the crazy ward, or the what would you call it, the deeply disturbed ward or the violent ward. And when she came back, 
she talked about it, but it was interesting because she didn't, at least with me, talk about it on, oh, my God, it was horrible, I want to kill myself. She said, you know, I always thought. I was always afraid that I was crazy like my mother. And she says, you know, I know that I have problems. She said, but when I got in there, she said, those people were really nuts. And I suddenly said, she said, I knew I wasn't that crazy. <laughs> From the clinic, she would soon be taken by Joe DiMaggio and placed in a more open hospital for mental and emotional exhaustion. In a kind of jangled climax, there was again the sound of doors closing, the waiting reporters crowding around her, asking the same questions they'd asked so often before. I mean, they're going to take, like, pieces out of you. And I don't think that they realize it. You know, they're kind of grabbing pieces out of you. And, gee, you know, you, you do want to stay intact. Like a white knight of old, Joe DiMaggio had rescued Marilyn in distress, taken her finally to Florida. Now, old friends watching the waves roll in and the afternoon fade, he helped her back to a moment of calm. Back in Los Angeles, she looked about, then, having lived in no fewer than 54 homes in her lifetime, she at last bought a house of her own in a quiet Brentwood area. Later, off to Mexico to buy furnishings, she again found herself a target of the press, intent on discovering all that might be most personal and private, seeking camera angles that were plainly rude. She was a, a very lonely person. And um, one sensed that. You sensed the loneliness about her. But, I mean, you know, nobody ever analyzed it or thought about it or said, hey, what's the matter? You seem very lonely. That was just the way she was. In April 1962, after makeup tests at 20th, Marilyn began work in Something's Got to Give, a comedy about a long-lost wife who reappears as her husband is about to remarry. In this scene never before shown, she tries to renew ties with her children. doesn't want people to see. You know what he does? What? He has somebody else cry for him. How does that help? You'd be surprised. Can I cry for you? Yeah, silly. I'm glad. <laughs> While production proceeded, Marilyn herself often disappeared. During one of her absences, the studio executives were surprised to see her at a Madison Square Garden celebration of President Kennedy's birthday. Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. I was honored when they asked me to appear at Madison Square Garden. You know, I was a little worried about my voice, but it came out. But still, I do know this tune. I can't forget the words, happy birthday has always been happy birthday. Happy birthday. 
say to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, Mr. President, happy birthday to you. Everybody! I'll retire from politics after having had a happy birthday sung to me in such a sweet, awesome way. But at 20th, the executives were not amused. Claiming sickness, Marilyn had worked only 12 days out of 31. On June 1st, Marilyn celebrated her own 36th birthday on the set, later attended a benefit at Dodger Stadium. It would be her last public appearance. Within the week, the studio halted production and fired Marilyn. If I had had a child, I wouldn't want a child of mine to go through what I've been through. I like to stay here and now, fame is fickle. It stirs up envy, fame. Who does she think she is, Marilyn Monroe? In days to come, there would be daily visits to her psychiatrist. Again, there were rumors of abortion, reports of dependence on drugs and alcohol. Then, the shock of silence. Suddenly, she was gone. Dead, it was said, by her own hand. Yet there were unanswered questions. Missing lists of telephone calls, changing versions of her final hours. It was reported that she'd been close to President Kennedy and his brother Robert. Some held she was disappointed in love, others that her death resulted from an accidental overdose. Yet, despite the sometimes tawdry details, Marilyn remains a strangely captivating figure of innocence, a storybook heroine wandering through a world in which fate is often determined by accidents. She had so much promise, and uh, her promise was early choked off, you know. She never fulfilled her promise. There is a rescue fantasy about her. You know, men wonder if they could have loved her enough to save her. Women love, wonder if they could have been her friend and supported her and made her feel less alone. I think she wanted people to care for her, for her as a person, for her, you know, not, not the Marilyn Monroe, not the double M, not the whole thing, but to care for what was inside of her, what she had going on. There was something that Marilyn used to say before every take, and it was the way some of us, let's say, would say a prayer. She would say, hold a good thought for me. And I looked around at all these millions of people who never knew her, and I mean, they are holding a good thought for her. She would love it. Sometimes during her final weeks, Marilyn went alone to this nearby park and watched the children play, perhaps searching for the child she so long had wished to have, yet for reasons of health or scandal had been denied. Or perhaps she was searching for another child whose longings and dreams remained unanswered the Norma Jean she might have been, the childhood that never happened.